Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us the ISEMINAR seminar series. My name is Gisa Kyun. I am host today's seminar. Since 20, uh, 2010, ISNA has been hosting the seminar series on carbon neutral energy issue with world leading researchers. Today, we are pleasured to have with us the Professor Edwin Eisner. You know, our use the same name of Eisner. I would like to introduce, briefly introduce speaker. Uh, Professor Eisner is one of the most distinguished professor in the research area of the interfacing chemical science, uh, chemical biology and synthetic chemistry and material science and engineering relevant to the development of solar driving process. Today, he will give us the lecture of his recent progress to con construct the uh, prototype solar panel device for the conversion of the carbon dioxide and solid waste stream into pure and chemicals through molecular surface engineering with triple core calories. Amazing. Okay. And Professor Lesna listed his PhD from University Wing uh, 2005. And then soon he postdoctoral experience, Professor Steve John Lippard at the MIT, and Professor uh, Fraser Armstrong at the University of Oxford. And then he joined the University of the Cal uh, Cambridge as a university lecturer in the Department of the Chemistry and as a fellow state uh, Johnson College in 2010. In 2015, he was appointed a leader and uh, his current position of professor of energy and sustainability in 2017. He was received many awards for for example, the Conde Morgan Prize by Royal Society of Chemistry. And he also directed many European research councils related on sustainable energy, such as proof of the concept of grant of the uh, enzyme hybrid material for solar fuel synthesis. Okay, I will introduce uh, my institute vice director, uh, Professor Tatsumi Ishihara, who will give a welcome speech to speaker for this seminar. Uh, please, the, the Professor Ishihara. Okay, so first of all, uh, Professor Raisna, thank you very much to have the seminar today. On behalf of the Aisna, I would like to say thank you. And uh, we are very looking forward to your seminar today. And in fact, as the Professor Yoon said, this is a 10th kind of the anniversary <laughs> of the webinar series. And um, we invited several the quite famous the researchers from all in the world to have the, this seminar. And today we have the very nice, um, interesting subject uh, given by the Professor Reisner. And uh, I'm very, we are the very looking forward to have your seminar. So thank you very much to accept today's seminar and, and thank you very much to have the, the interesting talk today. So please, thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Professor Ishara. Now, uh, beginning with, the, uh, with the, this seminar, I would like to take a moment to remind you that uh, if you have a question uh, after the presentation, please use, use the right hand button or the type your question comment in Q&A box. When you call on, please unmute yourself, okay? Uh, this web, uh, webinar will be recorded and make the available on the web, the uh, ISNA web, website. Now, everyone, please welcome the Professor uh, Reisner.
And today she's presenting title as a solar panel for light to chemical conversion. Uh, Professor Lesner, now it's all your times. Please start. Great, thank you so much, Professor Yoon and Professor Ishihara for the very kind introduction and having me today. It's really fantastic to be back virtually, at least to Kyushu. I had already a very pleasant visit um, a couple of years ago and I hope to return in person soon. So also here from my side, many congratulations on 10 years of your Eisner um, seminars. And you can also see I've adjusted my name for celebration purposes. My name in fact is very similar to Eisner, it's just an R in front, Reisner would be the correct pronunciation. So the, the title of my talk is Solar Panels for Light to Chemical Conversion. Um, I will start with an introduction, briefly talking about the justification why we're interested in solar energy, um, then why we're interested in sustainable chemicals and the circular economy, and then introduce the concept of solar panel type technology for chemical synthesis. So what do I mean with, with solar panels uh, for light, light to chemical generation? Um, you are all familiar with solar panels that you have on your roofs and you see everywhere now that are producing electricity. And there's been amazing progress. And that's, of course, very important. But it still does only solve a part of our sustainability problem. If we look at the global um, power demand, which is shown here on the left, these are approximate figures from this year, that's about 20 terawatt. But electricity only covers about four terawatt. This means as we um, produce more solar panels, wind parks, hydroelectric dams, nuclear power plants, effectively what we are doing is generating more and more electricity. And we are already in some countries getting very close to cover all of the electricity demand. But this does not really solve the problem of the remaining power that we're using that's being used in the form of fuels. And currently these fuels are oil, gas and coal. And of course, in the mid or long term, we need to replace those by sustainable fuels or energy carriers. And these really are the majority of our global power demands, so about 16 terawatts. And we do not really have very good solutions for those. So I think from a basic science point of view or from an academic point of view, this is a very attractive target. And that's why we're interested in the idea of developing solar panels that can actually produce fuels and chemicals to address this challenge. So why do we want to do this with solar energy? And I'd like to make an economic case for solar energy. That's not an ideal ivory tower argument, but it's really just economic numbers or dollars that I think can um, bring good justification why solar energy is the way to go. So what you can see here is a plot where you, we have on the y-axis the cost of electricity, which, which can be here synonymous for energy. And this is expressed at levelized cost of energy in US dollars per megawatt hour. And what this means is this is the cost of you would pay for electricity if you were uh, to build a plant today, run it until the end of the lifetime and make no profit from it. So I think it's a good metric to think about energy cost. It does not take into account things like energy storage, transport, etc. It's really just a generation part. And to keep it simple, I only have two time points, 2009 and 2019. And if we think, look at nuclear as an example, I know, of course, this is particularly sensitive in Japan, but the price has actually globally gone up. And this is due to uh, less nuclear power plants being, um, being built and also safety constraints becoming more and more severe, which drives prices up. At the same time, coal as a fossil representative remained more or less constant. Gas has come down from 83 to 56. And then the renewables really look quite good in comparison. So wind at 2009 had a cost of $135 per megawatt hour. At 2019, it's about 41. And last but not least, photovoltaics. In 2009, when I started my laboratory, was at about $360 per megawatt hour. This is for silicon solar panels. And even at that time, when I talked to my colleagues in physics who worked on photovoltaics, they were quite pessimistic about the midterm outlook of prices. And I think even the most optimistic people could not predict the real uh, drop in prices down to about $40 per megawatt hour. And this has been really transformative. And this, of course, is why we see such a fast rollout today. And the faster we roll it out, the cheaper it gets, which means the learning rate of photovoltaics is about 20%. This means if we double capacity, the prices drop by 20%. And this is exactly what we have seen here with mass manufacturing. 
So as we continue to build more, the prices should in principle continue to drop until we start reaching saturation. And this is, I think, when chemistry will become very important, because this just means we can use these technologies, what we have learned and know about light harvesting, but instead of producing electricity, start driving sustainable fuel synthesis and, and chemistry. Um, you may notice these numbers are from 2019. Of course, quite a lot has changed in the last three years and the last half year in particular, with energy prices surging wildly. And this means especially the fossil fuel prices have gone up very dramatically, whereas in principle, the renewable prices should keep going down. So in fact, they're making a huge amount of profit at the moment, which again is an additional uh, bonus of working in a sustainable energy space. So what does this mean really for our chemistry or infrastructure. The energy transition will have profound in impacts. So today we drive or run organic chemistry of the fossil age. What do I mean by this? We have the resources fossil fuels and almost anything is built around the fossil fuels and what we gain from mining, if you like. And from these fossil fuels, we produce a wide range of basic chemicals. This goes from methanol, ethylene, syngas, ammonia, aromatics. These are all things you would produce in the petrochemical factories. And from here, you go to a wide range of products with examples here from plastic, fibers, foams, fertilizer, rubber, kerosene, chemicals. More or less everything is built ultimately from fossil fuels for a wide range, of course, of very important uses from healthcare, pharma, clothing, construction, food, vehicles, fuels. It really impacts everything we do. But to replace fossil fuels, of course, this will need to look very differently. So the big challenge is, is to build the organic chemistry of the post-fossil age where we have the same uses. In fact, not only the same uses, I think we actually wanna expand this, uh, we wanna grow further, but we need to deliver everything from sustainable resources. So this means, and I will show on the next slide, from carbon dioxide, waste materials, water, something we can really recycle and where we do not have a linear economy model and pollute and destroy the environment. The big challenge is how to do this. So this means we need different resource. This means we may need to source either similar chemicals as the basic chemicals here, or ideally actually different basic chemicals. So we, they don't need to be ultimately the same, because if we expand and have a broader variety of feedstocks, we also can produce more and different products. So we just expand again. So I think it's a huge opportunity, not just to replace what we already have, but actually to deliver very new and different type of products by accessing new sustainable chemistry. And again, I'm interested of, of doing this by sunlight. And of course, this is a very large global area of interest with many fantastic research groups working on this topic. So where do we stand on a timeline for the energy transition? And I, I like to compare electricity with chemical and making these sectors sustainable. So this is a recent report that was co-authored by two of my former PhD students, and I found this very useful. It shows the different sectors and their transition towards a low zero or net zero um, economy. If we start with the most mature electricity, you can see that this sector, and we go to the, to the timeline, that's a bit small, but we start in the 90s, where it was solution development. Then if you look at things like uh, wind solar became a niche market, and around 2017 was really the tipping point when sustainable technologies to produce uh, low carbon or at least or close to net zero electricity became mass market. So 2017. And today we see this very fast rollout and we are very soon approaching late market. So I think from an academic point of view, of course, there is space to develop better photovoltaics, for photovoltaics, but effectively it's a solved problem. So it's just a question, of course, making it more mature, better and improving it. But the technology is really ready. But this uh, and the same may be true, of course, as you electrify light road transport. So, you know, if you founding Tesla around the 2000 early 10s was a very good moment because this technology went from niche to mass, went towards niche market. And of course, if you survive this period, you're then in a very strong position to enter mass and late market development. So how does this look now for chemistry? And the chemistry space is really down here. So, you know, heavy transportation, aviation, shipping requires hydrocarbons or really liquid fuels. Then cement and chemical industry, of course, is an even more complicated aspect because there's such a broad variety of chemicals. And you can see if we just go to the most extreme case chemicals, Today, we are only just coming out of concept stage and solution development. So there's, you know, we are far away of really having um, 
a solution ready to market. We are just thinking and starting to deploy and really prototyping. We are not even at the niche market stage yet. And this means the tipping point is predicted to be about maybe 12, 13 years away in the 2000 or 10 years, 2030s in the earlies. And only here later on, we is expected to reach a late market in the, in the 40s. That's when I will retire. So there's a bit of time. So that's, I think it's amazing opportunity for centers like Eisner, but also all academics around the world, the research centers, because we can really be at the heart of this transformation if we start to develop the right concepts, proof of concepts, demonstrations and prototypes at this stage. I think I find this exciting. And this is the next five years, I think, could really be a very uh, golden age of this area for, for basic science research and tech transfer, really, in this case. So this just shows the difference, the tipping point for electricity of 2017. The tipping point for chemistry is predicted at 2032, and this will then see the transition for net zero fuels and net zero chemicals technologies. So we are about, we have a bit 15 more years compared to electricity generation. And this is my case here to work on sustainable and circular economy aspects when it comes to chemistry. So what's our approach, what we do in the laboratory, we look um, purely at sustainable resources as an input. So of course we do not want to use fossil fuels for obvious reasons. We look at things like water, at the very abundant um, liquid source of hydrogen, and we are also interested in sea and polluted sources, so not only distilled water we have in the laboratory. We look at components in air. The greenhouse gas carbon dioxide is particularly attractive, um, but there's also significant activity, especially by other groups on nitrogen. And last but not least, we've invested quite heavily in the last five years on waste. And what I mean with waste is biomass waste, plastic waste, and also organics that can be considered as, as waste compounds. And this is just shows you one picture that's from an excursion. In fact, the first trip we did after all the lockdowns, and this shows the uh, applied waste to chemical conversion team of my laboratory visiting the local waste recycling facilities in Cambridge. And what you can see here in the back is a mountain of plastic waste that's actually deemed as non-recyclable. So all of this will go to incineration or part of it possibly to landfill and will not be mechanically recycled. And this, I'm showing this just to show you there's a huge space and still need available to look at better recycling strategies. And while mechanical recycling is preferred in many cases, there's still a significant amount of space for chemical recycling, where we really take the plastics apart and build something else, or ideally even upcycle to more interesting chemicals. This talk will solely deal with solar powered chemistry, as I mentioned with solar panels, where we take these inputs and derive sustainable fuels and vectors. So something that has already interesting chemical composition and has high energy contents. That's very important for the success of chemistry. And of course, hydrogen is important here. And I really recall the fantastic hydrogen facilities at uh, Kyushu when I visited, very impressive uh, town and prototyping center. Then ammonia is of interest for fertilizers, but also for hydrogen storage and long range shipping. And we're also interested in carbon monoxide and formic acid. And I will talk a little bit about these two in particular today. And then with these feedstocks, um, they're either fuels already, or we can really feed them into an established chemical industry to derive synthetic fuels such as green gasoline and kerosene. So hydrocarbons that are liquid, fertilizers I've mentioned from ammonia, and really to feed the chemical industry sector to make plastics, pharma materials in a sustainable manner. And then, of course, we want to reuse and reutilize these products as much as possible, recycle. But even in the worst case scenario, we just consume them and we reform our resources. And this just shows this is a true circular economy model where we can just even the waste can be reused to rebuild our products here. Okay, so let's start with the scientific part um, of, of the talk or the, uh, the technical part. So the idea of solar panels is the following. If you take essentially one of your PV modules from the roof and just put it in a solution, and in the solution you also have some substrates that you want to convert to in chemistry. So this means the solution is usually water, or in fact, in all cases I'm showing today is water, and then we have some substrates in which can be carbon dioxide and waste. And when you then expose the solar panel with sunlight, of course it absorbs the energy and rather than generating a current, it uses that energy to drive the chemical reactions. And this idea actually has been floating around for a while, um, but the first real practical prototype is only about 11 years old and was reported by the Nocera group. 
And what this shows is, and this was uh, termed as the artificial leaf, what they employed was a triple junction silicon solar cell that was sandwiched with two different catalyst layers. So one catalyst on one side was a nickel molybdenum zinc that was responsible for hydrogen evolution. And on the other side, um, there was a, a, a cobalt phosphate catalyst for water oxidation, so driving the two half reactions. And overall, the, the reaction was then taking H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. And there was uh, it was a very popular publication. Uh, it caused a lot of interest. It also co caused a very significant commercial attempt. But this commercial attempt was then abandoned because even in the most optimistic scenarios, the hydrogen being produced could only be produced at about seven to eight dollars per kilogram. And this at the time was significantly above any targets that would make it commercially viable. And the Department of Energy in the US would set the targets at about two to three dollars per kilogram. So if you're above that number, it will be very hard to make money from such a progress. So the, this was, a, I think, a, a very nice example. Um, it was very simple indeed, but again, not economically practical. So the idea was actually for us, um, OK, hydrogen is cheap. It's very tough to get on the market with this. But what if we generate more value in the process? So rather than making hydrogen, can we convert CO2 to more valuable products? And even can we upcycle waste to interesting organic chemicals? So maybe this then will ultimately turn the economics in our favor. At least this is the basic idea and inspiration here. And in order to do so, we need to think much more about catalysis. So making hydrogen, I would argue, is a, is a relatively easy chemical transformation because you deal with, fair enough, with two electrons and two protons, but ultimately we have efficient catalysts and you do not need to worry about side products because really the only product will be hydrogen in such a system. But if we want to think about CO2 reduction or waste conversion, we really deal with much more complex chemistry. Um, it can often be dealing with, with more electrons and, and protons, but certainly selective selectivity is a much bigger problem. So we need to think about integrating catalysts to make this energy efficient and make sure we can really source products cleanly. And what we are doing in this aspect, and we have experience for more than a decade now, is to integrate catalysts, single side catalysts, on surfaces. And we can do this on semiconductors or, or any conducting matrix, and this can then be used in the solar panel technologies. I will not talk much about mechanisms and catalysis today, but it's still important to emphasize that's much of the background for the chemistry we are doing. So here you have two possibilities. Either you take or what we are doing a really a molecular single site active site. Again, this can be just a synthetic catalyst, but it can also be an enzyme. And then you find a way how to link this and anchor this to your surface. Or alternatively, you have single site catalytic sites where on a, on a heterogeneous substrate, you can really control substrate and product access and release. And importantly, stabilize intermediates. Again, we have a selective and efficient catalytic reactions here. And the microenvironment should not be underestimated. So we look into this quite closely at the moment. Um, in this context, it's also important for me to mention the, the really important contributions that were before in this field when it comes to CO2 reduction catalysis. Um, on the left, you see a publication by Arai uh, and Morikawa from the Toyota labs, in fact, in Japan. And what they have shown is you can take, and I will just take, uh, you can build, here's a photoelectrochemical cell. And on the cathodic side, when it comes to CO2 reduction, they're using an indium phosphide semiconductor that's then coated with a ruthenium polymer. And this ruthenium polymer can reduce CO2 to formic acid. On the right-hand side is another example, actually also from uh, Japan, Ishitani, Abe, and Maeda were involved in this publication. And what they are doing, they're also modifying semiconducting surfaces, in this case, a nickel oxide photocathode with a dye, a light absorber ruthenium, and then a rhenium CO2 reduction catalyst. So this one would reduce CO2 to carbon monoxide. But there were limitations in these systems. So precious metals are being used. And also here, for example, an applied bias. And ultimately, we're also interested in really integration and, and wireless devices. But the Japanese community is very strong indeed in this type of, of work. So today I will cover just a couple of, of reactions to keep it simple. So the first one I've introduced, water splitting. Always please keep in mind, these are two half reactions. So you need to reduce water to generate hydrogen and you need to oxidize water at the same time to source the oxygen. Then I will talk about CO2 splitting, where CO2 is reduced to carbon monoxide and water oxidized to oxygen. And the water is not shown because it's a net zero in the, in the equation. If you reduce CO2, to formate, you can also couple this to oxidizing water to oxygen. 
And then I will also talk about CC bond coupling by uh, reducing CO2 to acetate and oxidizing water to oxygen. So these are all reactions with various difficulty. Um, I would almost say we go from top to bottom in terms of difficulty. Maybe that, that middle two are similar. But importantly, with difficulty, I mean kinetic difficulty. Because thermodynamically, they're all very similar. And these are cell potentials at pH 7. And you can see they're all endothermic. So with a significant positive Gibbs free energy. But ultimately, the energy requirement is quite similar. So if I talk later on about the solar panels, you will see that always when we discuss chemistry that's coupled to water oxidation, there are two light absorbers to make sure we have enough driving force for efficient um, uh, reaction rate in this case. The one type of reaction that's a bit distinct is the one when it comes to waste, uh, waste reforming or waste oxidation coupled to fuel synthesis. So I just show one reaction here, and this is glucose. And I'm showing glucose just as a model, cell, model substrate from uh, cellulose that I will show in a second. And if you convert cellular glucose with water into hydrogen and CO2, <clears throat> you will see that this Gibbs free energy is roughly zero. So we are thermoneutral, and the solar energy really just provides the energy input to drive the kinetics, so overcome the kinetic barriers to drive the reaction. So in all systems, we are using waste. Actually, a single light absorber is sufficient, which is a significant advantage uh, in terms of rate of catalysis. And one of the waste substrates we are using is lignocellulose. The structure is shown here on the bottom, where we have a cellulose core that's crystalline. We have the amorphous hemicellulose, and we also have a, a, a polyphenolic lignin that's wrapped around to really protect um, well, this, this biomass here. And the reason why we are so interested in ligno lignocellulose conversion is it's because it's the most abundant form of biomass. And equally important, it's not in competition with agriculture. So we cannot eat it, we cannot digest it, and this makes it a true waste product of the agricultural industry. So it's a really good waste product. The challenge, of course, is it's very inert and hardly soluble. So if we think about catalysis with a heterogeneous catalyst or a solar panel, we need ways to pre-solubilize this substrate. And I will, I will mention in a second how we do this. Um, we also use plastic waste for the reason I mentioned before. There's still a huge amount of plastic waste being generated that's not recycled and that's either just being burned um, or, in, or being disposed of. So today, um, what I wanted to, to say straight away is that all the products I'm showing in the reactions um, have been confirmed by isotopic labeling to be sourced from carbon dioxide. So they've not only been quantified, but also we know they're really coming from CO2, which I think is very important. Um, none of the systems I will be showing or the devices has an electrochemical bias voltage. So these are really standalone devices, and we're also not feeding in sacrificial reagents. So we're always looking at two meaningful half reactions in the chemistry. The light I'm using is simulated solar light, so in specifically air mass 1.5 global. This just means it really emulates real world conditions on an average global standard. Um, the systems I'm using are aqueous, so there's no organic solvents being used as well. And we usually use neutral conditions or close to neutral conditions, except for the waste reforming. Because I mentioned before, we have to pretreat this waste. So I think in all systems I will be showing, we use alkaline pretreatment just to hydrolyze the waste, the cellulose or the plastics to, to perform soluble fragments. The atmosphere in all systems is either carbon dioxide when it comes to CO2 reduction or nitrogen atmosphere when we talk about proton reduction. Sometimes for disclosure, we have methane in there as an internal standard, but in all cases, we have confirmed that this methane is innocent. So it's not part of the chemical reaction at all. And everything is done at room temperature and pressure. So it's also not a high temperature process or high pressure. It's all room temperature and pressure, so ambient conditions, except that we usually uh, avoid oxygen in the product. So it's anaerobic at the start of the reaction. OK, so to, to delve straight in, the first system I'd like to show was assembled here by, by Virgil Andre. And this is already one of these artificial leaves for CO2 reduction. And you can see, it, I will show more chemistry, of course, in a second, but just to keep it simple as a start, we have two light absorbers here. Uh, one light absorber is a wide band gap business venetate light absorber that's coupled to an oxygen evolution catalyst. And the second light, light absorber is a lead halide perovskite to be specifically a more advanced triple cation lead halide perovskite that's particularly suitable here. And this perovskite then can drive a syngas catalyst. So when we expose this to light, the UV and the blue are absorbed by the business venerdate, 
and the rest of the visible spectrum by the perovskite, and this drives the conversion of CO2 and water to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And this is known as syngas, this gas mixture here. And at the same time, the electrons are being sourced from water oxidation to oxygen. So how does this look like? Just to give you an idea of a very early um, device we have been building, this is the leaf, light comes from the left, and you can see in the front here the syngas generation and at the back the oxygen generation. And for full disclosure here, this is not real time. This, I think, is 100 times forward. This is just to show you, to illustrate that we can actually produce the, the product on two different places of the panel. So syngas or the fuel on one side and the oxygen on the other side. And the big advantage is here that this allows us to separate the hydrogen and CO from the oxygen. The disadvantage is that we build up pH gradients, and I will um, later on say a little bit more about that. So here are the details of this stack. Um, the, 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 the oxidative part, the business vanadate with, with cobalt is, is quite standard. What's less standard is the use of the perovskite. And the, the reason is that these perovskites are known to be highly efficient in the photovoltaics community, but they're also known to be extremely moisture sensitive. So in fact, to use this in such an aqueous environment, uh, you really need to protect and seal them off that they're not exposed to an aqueous electrolyte. And how do we do this? We just take the perovskite and put it between a nickel oxide and a PCBM charge transfer layer. This is an inverse structure, so holes go to the nickel oxide, electrons to the, the fullerene. And then, importantly, we have introduced a new sealant. And this sealing is made out of fields metal. And fields metal is an eutectic alloy made of indium, bismuth, and tin. And it melts at about 80 degrees Celsius. So what we do with this device, we just put it on a heat plate. We put the fields metal on top, heat it up to 80 degrees. And then the fields metal melts, and you can nicely seal off the entire device. And this temperature is really good because it still does not damage the perovskite. Once you go beyond 120 degrees, it will really start to damage the light absorber. And another advantage of the fields metal, since it's an alloy, it's conducting. So it allows us to integrate now our molecular catalysts for the CO2 reduction. And in this case, what we have used is a, is a nanotube, actually a nanotube forest, so a high surface area material that's conducting. And then we pi pi stack and integrate this cobalt porphyrin catalyst that has been known to reduce CO2 to CO. And in our case, it works with a turnover number of about 3000. It's a fairly good system in terms of the catalyst. And this really, it took us actually quite a long time. In 2012, when we set out to doing, to develop standalone uh, devices for CO2 reduction, well, there was nothing known in the literature. There was clearly no strategy. And it's really nice to see, um, well, that, that we could build this device, but not only us, many other groups around the world have made really tremendous progress, especially when it comes to CO2 reduction catalysis. So I'm very excited to be part of this network of, of, of good scientists. And the reason why we're interested in syngas specifically, and in fact, this whole center was built on sustainable syngas, is because it's such an important chemical feedstock. So today, syngas is being produced from fossil fuels, from steam reforming on a hundreds of megaton scale, but of course, it's not green. And if we could just generate the syngas sustainably, we really could convert a lot of established industry processes and make them sustainable. And you can use this, for example, to make liquid fuels through uh, Harper Bosch, no, sorry, through Fischer Drops uh, process. You can make chemicals such as methanol, you can make pl plastics, you can make fertilizer. This would be the Harper Bosch process. And you can also, with the hydrogen, start replacing um, uh, coal or carbon to make steel. So there can be huge implications if this could really be made economically viable. We, we are still far away from this. Um, here's some data. This shows now the photocurrent generation over time during irradiation in the white area here. And this is a real standalone device with no applied bias. And you can see the current generation here. It's quite stable for the first couple of hours or even days. And then we see this dramatic collapse. And this collapse is actually when the ceiling starts breaking and we get some traces of moisture into our perovskite. It dissolves the perovskite and it really destroys the device. What you can see is here in the color traces in the, in the red, blue, and gray here is the amounts of products we are forming. So red is the carbon monoxide, blue is hydrogen, and the gray trace is oxygen. So it's, it's good, steady activity. But you can see that the, the, the ratio is not perfectly two to one in terms of syngas 
to oxygen. There's, there's not enough oxygen in the system. And the reason is because the Faraday yield for water oxidation is not quantitative um, for reasons I can also explain later, but that's not unexpected. And overall, we are quite pleased, at least for a very first system, we were quite pleased with that. The big disadvantage, um, I think for those in the area who will have spotted this already, is the current densities are low. So we're only looking at maybe 0 0.12 million per square centimeter. And if you translate this to solar to fuel conversion efficiency, this is really taking all the energy in the solar spectrum and how much you have stored in the fuel. This is quite low and sits here at about 0.1%. Okay, I think it's a start, but which we could show it works, but it does not work very efficiently. So, but but we, we tackled um, to improve this system on various fronts. And the first one was actually looking at developing um, thinner, lightweight, and more resource benign artificial leaves. And actually not worry too much about efficiency. I come back to this later. And this is the, the, the most advanced we have at the moment. So in this case, we thought, you know, can we replace the glass, which is heavy and actually expensive because it's conducting glass. Um, and can we also replace the fields metal because it's very bulky and heavy by something lighter and flexible? And yes, we could do this. So the first thing, um, the fields metal, sorry, the quality is not very good, but the fields metal we just replaced by graphite epoxy. And graphite epoxy, in this case, we use some 10 to 30 micrometer thick layers. This nicely can seal the device um, and also it's conducting so we can still integrate our catalyst layer. To replace the conducting class was a bit more tricky, and we used two different approaches here, or combined approaches. The first was when it comes to the perovskite, we could just replace the glass by conducting PET or conducting plastic substrate. This was not an issue because we did not need very high temperature processing. However, for the anodic side with the business vendor date, we need annealing. So in this case, plastic substrate was no option. So we ended up using an ultra thin titanium foil that we could then anneal. But the titanium foil is so thin that it's very light and you can also bend it. So ultimately we could actually assemble this lightweight, flexible and bendable leaves. The only drawback we have is that the titanium is not transparent. So we do not have a true tandem stack where light goes to, uh, at the same time through both light absorbers. What we have here is in the outside is the business vendor date. And in the inside, then we have the perovskites where the, the light is being absorbed. But in operation, what you have now with this leaf, you can put develop on the bottom your CO2 reduction to syngas, and on the top, we can generate our oxygen. And to illustrate that this is really lightweight, um, you can this even start floating under operation. So here, I think we have some concentrated solar light. Uh, when you hit the device and the bubbles start generating on the bottom here, the syngas, you can see actually it starts lifting up. So we like to think about these leaves now as lotus leaves or artificial leaves and um, which clearly have some advantages that you would not have in a classical photovoltaic electrolyzer configuration. We got excited um, and we, we looked at the real world applications. And in fact, what I'm showing here is a, a glimpse of Cambridge, this is specifically St. John's College. I'm a member of that or a fellow of this college. You can see here some older parts of the college from this is 1600, this would be 17th century. And then this year is, is new court. I come to this in a second. So new court because it's only 200 years old. And then here in between these buildings, we have the river cam. And in fact, uh, Virgil, uh, he developed these floating leaves. He took these artificial leaves here and put them into a sealed bag. And the sealed bag simply contains some water and carbon dioxide. And since they are so light, they really float on the river and we can under real light floating convert CO2 into syngas, just as an illustration applicability. This is again, not very efficient, but I guess, well, it's just fun. I guess we can leave it there. And this is also, of course, uh, the, the garden of Virgil. Virgil has his office here. And in fact, I have my office here and I'm actually talking at the moment from this very room here at the back of, of Newcourt. So sending, sending my regards to, to all of you. These floating leaves, um, I think from a chemical point of view, are, are novel, but th the idea has been around for a while and, and there are quite an ambitious attempt to realize this for photovoltaics. So what I'd like to show you is actually one example from Japan, where we have a solar uh, array at Sakeide. This is a Kagawa prefecture at the island of Sh um, Shikoku. And what you can see is simply vast arrays of, of photovoltaics. I believe this is silicon, 
where it's being advantageous to go on the sea simply to, to save space. And uh, if you think about Japan, of course, with high population density, the use of, of certain um, water resources could really be beneficial. I don't think we should put these panels everywhere. Um, of course, we need to think about biodiversity and environmental impact, but there could well be places where it makes a lot of sense to use um, open water sources. But you can also see that the silicon panels are actually relatively heavy, so they need quite a solid construction. And you also on see need to think about wiring and how to take off the electricity. And here actually floating chemistry leaves could also have some, at least gives, gives a new conceptual view of this could potentially be done in the long term future. Um, there are even people who think about floating islands. So there's a PNS paper here where it has been proposed to have millions of these football, uh, football pitch sized um, photovoltaics generating and doing chemistry floating on the ocean. Ocean. Not sure if if if, if I'm a fan of that, but at least it it shows people are really thinking about open water applications of solar technologies. Okay, so we were thinking then next about efficiency, um, and I've mentioned before our efficiencies were low and be below one percent for syngas generation or CO two reduction, and this really was because our CO two reduction catalysts were synthetic catalysts. And even the best catalyst we have employed required a significant overpotential um, to operate, which means you have to give them a couple of hundred millivolts until actually they start catalysis. And this is work that was started by Esther Moore and Sam Kopp is, is working on this now. This was really the idea of integrating redox enzymes. Um, in this case, for example, hydrogenase, or later on I will show you to reductases, that can work much more efficient and do not require this large overpotential. So these are catalysts that work at the thermodynamic potential. What this means is just even a couple of, of tens of millivolt push uh, beyond, beyond the thermodynamic limit will drive the catalysis. So this means from an applied bias point of view, we can actually save a couple of hundred millivolts. And this should really translate in higher activity of our artificial leaves. And long story short, that's exactly what we've seen. So the stack here is the same, except the, the, the fuel producing part. And what we have done is we have replaced the carbon nanotubes by some porous metal oxide scaffold that we have to develop to integrate these catalysts. And indeed, when we use these hydrogenases, in this case, a nickel iron selenium hydrogenase, we can readily reach an efficiency of 1.1%. We can replace this hydrogenase by carbon dioxide reducing enzymes. In this case, it's a formate dehydrogenase. Also here, I don't want to spend too much time, but in the same stack, just replacing the hydrogenase by formate dehydrogenase we can now convert carbon dioxide into formate. But I will just show a little bit of data here because I think that's interesting. So what we see if we look at the bias free operation of current density over time again, we can see that we can now increase the current density from the 0 0.12 from this cobalt porphyrin catalyst to 0 0.7, let's say milliampere per square centimeter. So a significant increase. And this was only due by using this more efficient enzyme catalyst. And at the same time, what's actually I think is the most exciting is that this becomes a completely selective system. So we're really only producing formate, Faraday yield here of 80%, but this is just analytics and we cannot um, identify any hydrogen or other side products. So we are not co-producing hydrogen. And the higher current density also translates into a solar fuel conversion efficiency of 0.8%. But I also want to point out that these enzymes can actually sustain quite high, high current densities. So when we started working on enzyme photoelectrochemical systems maybe 10 years ago, I would have thought one milliampere per square centimeter, maybe an upper limit. But indeed, under certain conditions, and also here I won't discuss in detail, we can already go to five milliamp and approach 10 milliamps per square centimeter, which means in principle, if we get the device right, um, the, the enzymes would not hold us back in terms of reaching a 10% efficiency in such systems. Again, we're not there because the stack is not designed to do this, but in terms of enzyme catalysis, the efficiencies can get quite high. The big drawback of enzymes is that they're actually very expensive. So the isolation purification is expensive and we can also only get very small samples and they're also not very stable. So I'm not claiming here again um, that enzymes can be devices. I'm just saying they can operate quite efficiently in terms of solar to energy conversion efficiency. Okay, so what about now replacing the water oxidation by waste to chemical oxidation? And this is work here by Supercheat. And what we did here, we used again the same perovskite stack as before on the photocathodic side. The only thing we reduced the CO2 reduction catalyst just with platinum to keep it simple and just to make hydrogen. 
And then instead of using a business venerdate second light absorber, we do not need a second light absorber for the reason I've mentioned before, because it's thermodynamically much easier. And we only use the dark electrocatalyst for waste to chemical oxidation. In this case, we use the nickel foam where we coal deposited cobalt uh, palladium catalyst on, on, on the system. And indeed, there are significant benefits of doing this. First of all, we are not only producing a fuel such as hydrogen, but we are also mitigating waste which can be plastic waste, for example. And ideally, if we get the catalysis right, we can also source products from the oxidation here. And I mentioned already, kinetics can be easier than water oxidation. And the advantage of thermodynamics is actually just illustrated here. So if you think about a single light absorber and you want to drive water splitting, since it's such a thermodynamically difficult reaction, you can really only use the UV and possibly a bit of the blue light. On the other hand, for waste reforming, since it's thermoneutral, in principle, you can really use the whole visible spectrum. And that's exactly what we're doing here in this artificial leaf, where, where we use the perovskite that really absorbs the visible and the UV. And this is just some of the chemistry um, we have been showing already. Again, here, also no details. Glycerol, we were interested because it's a byproduct from the biodiesel industry. If you produce a, a ton of biodiesel, there will be about 100 kilograms of glycerol as a byproduct. Ethylene glycol can be sourced from polyethylene terephthalate plastics, PET. So if you hydrolyze this under alkaline conditions, you will source ethylene glycol. We can oxidize this to glycolic acid. And also cellulose from lignocellulose can be broken down under alkaline conditions to glucose. And this then also we can oxidize in this case to gluconic acid. And here it's also just some of the data. All I want to show here really is two things. One, first of all, we are not bound to 0 0.12 or 0 0.7 milliamps oops, per square centimeter anymore. The, even in our first systems, we jumped straight to about 10 milliamps per square centimeter, simply because the chemistry is now so much easier. We do not need uh, the limiting business venerdate anymore, and we can really use a lot of the light and use this to drive the catalysis and chemical transformation. So actually, in terms of product rate and an area of irradiation, there's a significant advantage using waste substrates and replacing water oxidation. And also we have already reasonable control about the, the product selectivity on the oxidation. From the products I've shown before, like colic acid or gluconic acid, we reach selectivities already from 65 to 95%. So there's still improvement required, but as a starting point, I think I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Okay, oh, and then last but not least, to, to finish the artificial leaves part, we can also replace the, the lead from the lead haler perovskite by something like business oxy iodide. And I'm, I'm running out of time already, and I still have a few things to show. Um, all I want to say here is also business oxidite is just sandwiched between the charge transport layers. And also here, we just use the graphite epoxy uh, coating again. And then we use an, a, a, co a copper alloy for reducing CO2 to, to thin gas. Okay, so this is really what I wanted to, to, to tell you about one type of solar panels, uh, the artificial leaves to do chemistry. And before I go to the second part, I would just have a, a tiny break, a few seconds, and send some very late Halloween greetings from the laboratory. And this is a picture that was taken a couple of years ago by Tim Rosser. Of course, it was not planned. And this came from a photoelectrochemical experiment where we had a solar light simulator shining on a photoelectrochemical cell. And don't ask me how, but the shade really here produced this very nice pumpkin face, uh, which, which I wanted to share here with you today. So the second uh, solar panel technology I'd like to introduce, and this will be much shorter than the first part, are photocatalyst sheets. And this is really work that has been pioneered by the group of Katsunari Domen um, over many years, and in particular with the sheets now over the last six years. So what he's doing is um, he's depositing semiconducting powders effectively on conducting substrates. And this allows you to take suspension systems or solution systems on surfaces and really develop these panels. And for practical applications and efficiency, there are significant advantages. And what Professor Dorman has been using is molybdenum doped business venerdate as a light absorber and lanthium rhodium doped strontium titanate as a second light absorber. And they're all joined by a gold layer that, that really allows regeneration and, and charge flux between these two light absorbers. So if you photo excite the business venerdate, you oxidize water with a ruthenium oxide catalyst to oxygen. The photo excited electron regenerates the photo excited strontium titanate. And the conduction band electrons here are moved to the ruthenium to reduce water to hydrogen. 
And particularly impressive has been that not quite this system, but a, a single particle aluminum strontium uh, titanate system has been translated to a hundred square meter array of water splitting. And so I think it's a very important demonstration to the world that these things can actually be scaled with efficiencies that are meaningful, of course, not commercially viable, but very meaningful. And for quite long time, seven months, I think is amazing. And also the, the set scheme here has already demonstrated efficiencies of more than 1%. So we find this very appealing. So that the main difference between this system uh, and the leaves is really now is that in this case, we produce both products, hydrogen and oxygen, in very close proximity. That's a disadvantage because it means when we, we produce canal gas, hydrogen and oxygen together, which is dangerous, but it also needs to be separated by a membrane. On the other hand, this also offers a significant advantage because we are avoiding significant pH gradients. Because now water oxidation that releases protons and proton consumptions for proton reduction are very close together. So on a localized environment, avoiding buildup of pH gradients that are an issue uh, and something of concern for the artificial leaves. Okay, and here's a Qian Wang, actually the PhD student uh, who did pioneer this artificial, uh, this, this, this photocatalyst sheets. Um, I was lucky to attract her to my lab as a postdoc, and her task was to expand this photocatalyst sheets towards CO2 reduction. And in this case, we just kept everything the same. We just replaced the ruthenium proton reduction catalyst by a molecular cobalt catalyst for CO2 reduction. And this catalyst, when you reduce it, um, you reduce the cobalt. This, in this case, uh, this is anchored by a phosphonic acid, and even upon reduction, both terpidines stay on, but actually one pyridine, we believe, opens up a vacant site, so it just twists around, and when the vacant site, uh, site forms by the reduced cobalt, we form a cobalt hydride, and this can then re react with CO2 to form formate in this case. And here's the energy diagram, so we have the potential here. Um, and then when we photo excite the business venerdate, we oxidize the water to oxygen. Electrons again go to the to the donor level of the strontium titanate, and the electrons go to the cobalt catalyst and form our format. You can see from the elemental mapping that really all the elements and components are present. So we have the strontium titanate and the business venerdate. We have the cobalt and the ruthenium catalyst, and also the gold connector that transfer the charge is present on um, this photocatalyst sheets. And Jian is now an associate professor, in fact, at Nagoya University in Japan. So you're, you're very pleased that you could return to Japan. Um, the performance here has been very good in terms of selectivity. You can, we can see here the amounts of product versus the irradiation time. And it's a very clean so <clears throat> generation of, of formate and oxygen. So this required some optimization, et cetera. But ultimately, under these conditions, it got quite clean with the expected two to one ratio because this is a two electron process to reduce CO2 to formate and it's a four electron process to oxidize water <clears throat> to oxygen. Um, the efficiency is still quite low. It sits at about 0.1%. The selectivity I mentioned is very good for formate and the turnover number for the cobalt catalyst is about 400. Importantly, also the isotopic labeling is very clean. We can see here from the C212 that we only form uh, C12 formate with a singlet because the proton is now um, connected to a spin zero carbon. If we uh, label the C carbon dioxide with C13, we form indeed the C13 uh, labeled product. And now we see this nice doublet being formed here. And this doublet is formed because the label C13 has spin half and forms a doublet with the proton that's also spin half in the system. And if you do isotopic labeling, I really strongly recommend to run the proton NMR to look at this very characteristic splitting and not only the carbon NMR, because this just does not show you any of the splitting pattern at all. We could expand this here with Shafir Kalatil, uh, who, who also is, is now a senior lecturer at Northumbria University, was moved on to his independent position. And what he did is he replaced now uh, with Qian the cobalt catalyst, and we just started growing bacteria on top of these photocatalyst sheets. And the bacteria we used is Boromosa ovata, so an acetogenic bacterium that's known to be able to reduce carbon dioxide with hydrogen to acetate. So by growing this bacteria on top, this can actually take up the, the hydrogen being produced from the ruthenium catalyst and metabolize it with CO2 using this wood lungdal pathway to produce acetate. And it's nice to see that this, this long rods here are the bacterium and it really preferentially grows on the strontium titanate, so exactly where the, the hydrogen is being generated. 
because the strontium titrate are the small particles and this larger blocks here are the business venerate. So this is this SCM image of the system. And this may look familiar to a, a previous publication, in this case here from Peidong Yang. So what, what uh, Peidong Yang's group did before was sensitizing Murella, another bacterium that has a similar pathway with cadmium sulfide. And by photoexciting cadmium sulfide, also it was shown that CO2 could be reduced to produce acetate. However, there's one significant difference between these two systems, and that's that the previous report uses cysteine as an electron donor. And in this case, um, of course, you have to feed in cysteine as a sacrificial reagent, whereas we are actually extracting electrons from water to make oxygen. And also, it is now known that the cysteine is significantly metabolized as well to produce acetate. So it's not clean conversion in this case for CO2 to acetate. There's co consumption of cysteine to produce acetate. So how does this system work? Really quite well if it's integrated. So in this case, we have irradiation time versus amounts of products. We produce oxygen from the oxidation, and then we have the acetate from the bacterial production. And I should point out that this is the expected ratio, two to one, just the other way around, because oxygen production is again four electrons and acetate is eight electrons. I should also say here that this required even more optimization because this bacterium is actually quite oxygen sensitive. So it was important that the oxygen concentration in the headspace was kept as low as possible to make sure we are not damaging actually bacteria to produce the acetate. So if we separate now, if we do exactly the same chemistry, but separate the, uh, the, the photocatalyst sheets from the spiromosa of water cells, we see quite a different result. So in this case, and that we kept the experimental conditions the same, we produce mainly hydrogen and oxygen and quite little acetate. And that's because now the, the photocatalyst sheets generates the hydrogen and it's, it, it mainly accumulates here with some diffusing to the bacteria, but the bacteria does not benefit from the high local concentration when it really grows on the photocatalyst sheets. So I like this because it shows that there's a real benefit of integrated technologies. Um, this does not mean that these decouple systems do not work. It just shows that really under these dilute conditions we are working at, um, there is an advantage of really putting everything together. And also here the isotopic labeling is clean. If we have uh, C12CO2, we see a nice singlet of the acetate product in the proton NMR spectrum. If we label now with C13 the CO2, we have in the acetate two carbon 13s. This means our spin half proton needs to couple to two spin half carbons, which means we should see a doublet of doublets. That's exactly what we are seeing here, is here in the green trace. Okay, I think I've I need two more minutes if that's okay. I'm almost done. Um, we wanted also to couple this photocatalyst sheet systems that can convert carbon dioxide to acetate and demonstrate the in situ use of this acetate. And we were thinking quite a while how we could actually do this, but at the same time, we were working on microbial fuel cells that use an another bacterium that can convert acetate back to CO2 and generate the current. So what we're doing is now we use this photocatalyst sheets with this um, spiromosa ovata and couple this to a microbial fuel cell that consists of an, a porous indium tin oxide electrode where we grow geobacter sulfur reducens. And you can show, you can see this microbial fuel cell electrodes here on the bottom. These are SEM images. You can see the highly porous structure. And these little uh, uh, knots here or bugs here are the bacteria. And you can actually see them much better here zoomed in. So this is now one single pore. And you can see the rods are the geobacter. And the geobacter have one huge advantage over the spiromosa. They have a very well-developed electron transport mechanism in and out of the bacterium um, through the cell membrane. So they, they grow little nanowires that are conducting and you can actually push electrons in or pull electrons out by applying different uh, voltages. And that this bacteria grow nicely in the pores, you can see this uh, focused ion beam SCM on the bottom right, where the soft matrix are the bacterium and the, the, the smooth uh, really is the electrode. So it really penetrates the whole structure. These are about 10 micrometer pores and the film thickness is about 20. Um, to 40 micrometers. So if we couple these two together, we, put, we get acetate from the photocatalyst sheet. And then as we start accumulating acetate, also at some point, our microbial fuel cell switches on and start to produce a current. So it shows really we can accumulate acetate 
and enough acetate to drive a, material, uh, a microbial fuel cell to produce electricity. Okay, I think I will, in the interest of time, I will leave it there. Uh, we can also use this technology for waste conversion. So these are just photocatalyst sheet panels uh, where we shine light and break down uh, plastic waste or biomass waste. But I, I don't want to keep the audience for, for too long. But as a summary slide, I'd like still to introduce a classification of the solar chemis uh, chemistry panels that I've been talking about today. So I think first, from a design point of view, there are two options at the moment that are available. One, these are integrated artificial leaves, or you can also call them packed leaves, photoelectrochemical leaves, which follow a stacked and layered design. So I've, int I've introduced the leaves with the business venerdate and perovskites, for example, or and I've also shown these leaves for waste conversion. And again, the nice thing about this is the tunability, you can in principle replace individual layers and, and optimize them for the chemistry you ultimately want to run. And then in the final part, I've shown photocatalyst sheets um, where we have either two light absorbers on, on a conductive substrate to, to couple water oxidation here and CO2 conversion, or what I've really skipped is for photo reforming um, of waste substrates where you can just take, for example, carbon nitride as a semiconductor and to convert plastic and biomass waste to generate products and couple this to proton reduction. So, and I think now the number of light absorbers really depends on the chemistry you want to do. If you have thermodynamically challenging reactions, for example, coupling this to water oxidation, you want to go with two light absorbers. And if you look at easier, thermodynamically easier chemistry, like organic conversions, oxidations, where your Gibbs free energy approach is zero, I think you're much better off with a single light absorber. So that there's no point for you using a, a two light absorber stack if you're actually thermoneutral or even downhill. You're just overpowering your system, which actually comes at a cost of, of, of rate of catalysis in your, in your device. So here to, to, to finish just shows, I think, the progress in my research group. So 2012 was the time when we uh, built and published the first standalone design, uh, device for water splitting. You can see the solar light simulator here, the photoelectrochemical cell um, with a, a tungsten trioxide photoanode wired here to a cuprous oxide photocathode separated by a membrane. And this could split water with an efficiency of 0.1%. So it was not very efficient. But again, for us, it was great because it's the first time we didn't apply any external sacrificial reagents or applied bias. And this was being produced by Chia Yulin, who is now an, a, a professor at NCQU in Taiwan. And 10 years, 10 years forward, of course, with a lot of input from the community and general good progress, but in the lab, we can make these things far more efficient, so at, at least an order of magnitude and more. But most excitingly for me is we have learned how to integrate different catalysts. So we're not restricted anymore to water splitting or hydrogen generation. We can really think about CO2 reduction, um, hopefully soon nitrogen fixation and all sorts of organic and waste upcycling systems. And this really, I think, broadens the chemistry scope and ultimately generates more value. And maybe in the long term future, this can really become a commercially interesting system as well to explore. I leave it here as well. I would just like to thank my, my group. Um, I've, I've showed a, a few key members already, but I could really thanks to everyone. I'm a very proud member of this team. The funding bodies are shown at the top. Um, I also have to thank the collaborators. Richard Friend um, helped with the photovoltaics characterization. Judith Driscoll um, with material aspects. Rob Hoy with the business oxyiodide in particular. Ines Pereira on the enzymes and biocatalysts. And Katsunari Domen on the photocatalyst sheets. And last but not least, there are also a couple of open positions if anyone is interested in the work we are doing and would like to come to Cambridge for a PhD or a postdoc. Please apply. The deadlines are in a couple of weeks. So thanks a lot for your attention. I'm happy. Um, to take some questions and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think that you are amazing that you have a great research capacity. Anyway, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. I'm button the other. The, okay. Uh, post, okay, I see. Uh, okay. I, yeah. Could you? Okay, can uh, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bonat, yeah, please. Yeah. Great. Uh, could, so could, you, could you own your the the, the the your your could you show me your the page? Uh, I think I don't I don't have an okay. opportunity to show yeah. the camera. Mm. I mean, it doesn't Zoom doesn't allow me to. Okay, no problem. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Uh, anyway, anyway, yes. 
Uh, Professor uh, Reisner, thank you for your lecture. It's really, really, really interesting. For me, because I'm uh, focusing on a pair of Skype-like systems, I mainly have a question about this part of your presentation. So it seems that pair of Skypes you're using are a little bit limiting your system because they're unstable. So it's uh, thinking that there, there are a lot of developing in the perovskite uh, area within the last 10 years. And for example, from the 3D perovskite systems, they went to 2D and 1D and 0D perovskites, which are a little bit more uh, resistant to water. Like they introduce more larger uh, organic hydrophobic cations. So have you considered using those novel perovskites in your systems? Yeah, so uh, th thanks for the question and uh, just a, a general uh, response on, on the limitation. So it's in terms of stability, you're correct, the perovskites are limiting. In terms of efficiency, it's the business vanadate. Um, but but to the, the, the stability of the perovskite, yes, completely. So in the, we are making at the moment all the perovskites in our lab, um, but we, of course, not perovskite experts. So what we have started now is collaborations with perovskite groups and um, and take their expertise, of course, to take uh, more suitable perovskite um, systems. So I'm aware of the 2D perovskites in, in particular, and we will look certainly and, ex and explore um, different perovskites in the future. But for, for now, everything I've shown, all the perovskite works was, was really done by one person, um, Virgil Andre, he's making all of those. So we, we tried to keep that aspect as um, consistent as possible to, to not overwhelm uh, our activities on the perovskite area. Okay, I see. And uh, then it's, out, it's also a question for me. So why do you need those two light absorbers? So this bismuth vanadate, uh, what part of the spectrum did it participate into? The bismuth vanadate? UV part? Uh, yes, it, it's only UV and blue light. I think band cap 2.6 electron volts, if I remember this correctly. And uh, But we need this really to drive the water oxidation. You, you can't do this with the perovskite, because the, with the perovskite, we generate a photo voltage of about a volt, or 1.1 volts. And that's not enough uh, to couple CO2 reduction to water oxidation. So you need a second light absorber. Okay, I see. And uh, I mean, I, I would agree. So the business vendor, this is just historic how we came into all this chemistry. The business vendor, then we need to replace it. It's, it's, it's far from ideal. It really limits our efficiency. Okay, I see. That's was really exciting because, uh, because I mainly uh, am in the field of OED and for us, it's usually like, one light material so seeing that you have two light absorbers that's pretty interesting for me mm -hmm. okay thank you very much yeah, but, but, but also but also here from from the pv community we, we do we st start taking a lot of inspiration because they of course have a dual triple junction etc so you know I, I think any voltage we need they can actually provide it's just a question how do you integrate the catalysis with available photovoltaic materials Yes, I was also wondering because there is a lot of organic photovoltaics which can be thinner and can be yeah. more stable even in the aqueous solutions, I think, than perovskites. We are working on that. Okay, I see. <laughs> yeah. It's done. Thank you. Bonus is done. Okay. Uh, next, uh, who is the Murai Murayas? Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much, so Professor Reisner, for uh, amazing talk. And uh, I have a question about the light, um, works for artificial leaves, mainly by Andre. So you showed us a very sophisticated design of the um, reaction system. But for for us, so probably minimum structure is. Uh, uh, water splitting, uh, sorry, water oxidation catalyst, cobalt catalyst, BVO, and uh, also CO2 reduction catalyst. But uh, so you showed us a very sophisticated structure. So could you explain about the key point of your device, if possible? And in other words, so uh, if possible, so could you explain a little bit about the try and error history and uh, what was the barrier to establish this kind of sophisticated? sophisticated structure uh, I, I think uh, so i understand from from your question you're familiar with the business vendor date so it's really only the perovskite part how, how we did it is that right ah uh, yes uh yes. yes so i can uh, well, just give me one second I, I think i have a 
a good slide for this. Okay, let me just share this again. So also we were not familiar. So the this is really how it started and how we got into this. So, so I, uh, again, I think, it, you know, if you're interested, I really think nobody needs to be scared um, at all because also, you know, we had no expertise with, with, with perovskites. The one thing I found most difficult was really um, the characterization because if you want to publish, um, there, there are all these uh, characterization tables and checklists you need to fill in. And if you're not a photovoltaic expert, it's a bit hard to do this in the beginning. So in this case, we were happy. We had a very strong photovoltaics group, the group of Richard Friend, who helped us with this. But in terms of the chemistry, I think, you know, even you, anyone, I think, can in principle do this if you have the facilities and glove box, etc. So this is really our starting. But in fact, Michaela started the encapsulation of the perovskite and, and, and pioneered this aspect in, in the group. And how did it actually start? Um, it started because it became quite obvious to us that at some point we cannot ignore all the great um, light harvesting materials from um, the photovoltaics field and also just looking at solid liquid junctions, classical semiconductor photoelectrochemistry probably was not the way forward in terms of building functional devices. So this means that at that time there was quite some activity on protection layers. So, for example, we, we also worked with cuprous oxide. I've, I've shown a slide at the very end, and there were some very nice papers at that time that you could just use atomic layer deposition to protect them. But we always found this rather complicated and thought there must be a much easier way to do this. And in, in the beginning, we actually started with the cuprous oxide, but then we were just sitting there and thought, you know, what's actually the most moisture sensitive light absorber for us to establish these uh, encapsulation strategies? And we came quickly to the perovskites, and this is how we ended up there. So it was, it was really more an, an accident thinking about protection layers rather than thinking about artificial leaves back then. But to come to your question, so what you need to do, of course, in, in the beginning, you start off, uh, most of these things I'm showing, they're all just spin coated. So especially in the beginning, we used only technologies and, and facilities that are readily available in a chemistry laboratory. Only later on, I showed a few things with chemical vapor deposition, vacuum depositions in general that become a bit more laborious. But for you to get started, a spin coder will take you very far, in fact. And we also like to keep things simple. So what you need to do is you need conducting glass. Of course, FTO coated glass you can buy. And then what you need is Again, this, this comes from the photovoltaics field. You, you take, in this case, just a methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskite, which was a, a very simple first one. And then you usually integrate this in charged uh, separation layers. So you need to make sure you get directionality and pull your holes on one side and the electrons on the other side to keep it very simple. And in this case, nickel oxide, for example, is, is, a, is, is for us now the best hole transport layer. You can also use some conducting organic polymers, as P.S.S. you will find very frequently. Also, the nickel oxide you can just grow on top of the FDO, the P.S.S. you can just spin coat on top of it. And then you, you can deposit your, your, your perovskite, also just from a precursor solution. And then comes a, a, a PCBM. So PCBM is a derivative of a Buckminster fullerene. That's just a very well established electron transport layer, also just coated on, on, on top of your perovskite. And this really is it. And all you need then is, is a silver as a connector. But actually, the most important, really, from this device, we just started then sealing off this with, with the fields metal. And this, and this really, you just have to be careful as well that the iodide is not in close contact, for example, with, with silver, because it would rip out some of the halides. But otherwise, Feels metal just on top, heat up, seal off, and that's it. And then it's even quite reducing. So if you just take then the feels metal protected um, photocathode, you dip it in a platinum precursor solution, it will actually even out to reduce um, the platinum on top of your feels metal. So you have the device assembled. What do we have here on the bottom? Ah, yeah, and then, I think, mm. uh, just, just one more second. And then actually in the beginning, all we did, so you had this photo cast out and then you so just have a copper wire and you can connect this at the back of your a business venerdate photo anode, right? Of course, now we, we want to get rid of such um, wiring, et cetera, and just have the uh, perpendicular, if you like, charge transfer. But this is how we started. These were the very first designs for these artificial leaves. Ah, thank you so much for kind answer. So uh, I understand. So for charge separation and uh, charge transfer and also protection. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, but, yeah. But, 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 
so to jump in, but really, I mean, to, uh, just go through photovoltaics literature. It's all established. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Keep things simple, because otherwise you will spend a lot of time of, of trial and error for things that, that are well known. Um, just, you know, you, you don't have to think too much about this whole transport layers. Just go into a publication and see and see what's the easiest to replicate and just use it. That, that's my recommendation. Oh, uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, I think the next uh, we think some uh, Watanabe Sensei, please. Can catch my voice. Thank you very much for your uh, very uh, nice questions. So uh, actually, I, I also uh, similar <laughs> uh, question previous one. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, additionally, my, my question is in this case, PCBM is a small molecule uh, with the solution processes. So in this case, I guess uh, this of the grain, uh, grain size or grain structure is related to is on your perovskite. Then perovskite grain, uh, grain size uh, uh, grows on the top of the PCBM. Still, uh, it is has have of the uh, grain to grain of the uh, edge. It is going to the uh, leakage point. So, uh, 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 but uh, so I, I, I wonder if in this case maybe polymer can be uh, more enhances of the protection layer. Uh, so, uh, why a PCB is, is a better choice? This is my question. Oh, I, 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 no, no, I agree with you. I, I would not say that PCBM is the best choice. It is just everything I've shown to, to is actually quite new in terms of the, of the leaves. We have not optimized this. So I it's, I, I agree. So PCBM, um, there, there will be better options there, but you know, you can only, uh, the work of the artificial leaves, it was one or two, three people working on different aspects, but it's, we need to be very careful on where we put our effort. So we, we are completely aware. So the, the one thing we've optimized is the nickel oxide. We know this, but on the PCBM, we have not really spent much time on optimizing, but I completely agree with you that there's room for improvement. I got it. I got it. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, more one questions. So uh, interestingly, in your uh, first topics, you are using the uh, cobalt porphyrin or the other porphyrin kinds of, kinds of small molecule uh, as a mm -hmm. co-catalyst. So uh, in the second topics is uh, your uh, co-catalyst of the molecule uh, is uh, anchoring uh, by, by using the phosphoric acid. But the first topic is uh, this is a physiotope. So just a physical uh, co coating on your catalyst. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, my image, uh, once your photocatalytic reaction is occurred, then a bubble is coming. Then bubble, sometimes this is uh, uh, enough to energy to exfoliation uh, for your catalyst in the case of the uh, physiosope. So uh, why uh, your uh, uh, system uh, can be uh, stabilized of the whole of the system? This is my question. Hmm, good, 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 good. But the, the, the it's it's physics, it's pi pi stacked, but it's still a very stable assembly. Uh, so I really I, I really would need to look into that. I'm sure we have quantified the amount of cobalt, but I'm pretty sure even in the first system the leakage would be very minor. Because it's also not water soluble. So it is really, you know, it's not just a pipe, it's also hydrophobic interaction that keeps yeah. it on the surface. And these and these cobalt porphyrins on nanotubes, I mean they're used for even for gas diffusion electrodes, etc. They're really robust assemblies. So it's, it's, it's true, it's not a chemisorbed uh, phosphonate linker, but actually I would even say in terms of robustness, it's probably even more robust than the phosphonates, especially under the reducing conditions. So we have, I cannot say that I would recall any significant leakage from this porphyrin pipi stacks on the nanotubes. I see, I see, got it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question the prop, uh, from the Wang, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for a very uh, wonderful uh, presentation. So um, I think the formal questions are more from the academic area, but here I'm from uh, uh, industrial, and so I am a company uh, a researcher. So, I'm, so as you said in your in early of your papers, uh, so the um, sunlight using for the chemical is still under research uh, fundamental research and maybe uh, as, as you said you maybe uh, have some uh, maybe need some more more some uh, kind of years to tear it uh, become to market and uh, so i'm wondering uh, in your opinion so what is the uh, uh, bottleneck for the uh, for this technology go into the 
uh, how to say the niche market, I think you uh, have the first uh, uh, milestone. Is, is there cost or that's just the, the performance? And my que second question that you have done a lot of the, uh, uh, how the systems for different kind of uh, uh, product. And uh, for, your, for your image, what kind of product is most, uh, most uh, have highest uh, potential to become the, go to the market? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very tricky question. I think, I mean, the, the, I think the, in terms of solar chemical technologies, there, there are many problems um, on the way. But I think the one of where I really do not have a good solution is, and and as I don't think the community is addressing at the moment because we're not there yet, is, you know, we we, we will be talking about very large areas. Yeah. So if if you collect if you make a guess i can definitely see you can collect this quite easily so for example the i've, I've showed the 100 square meter domain system where you of course mm -hmm. have you just need to separate but i can see how you collect this mm -hmm. but if you really want to make organic chemicals or liquid products mm -hmm. how do you do this then on, on a couple of square kilometer scale how do you distribute the substrates how do you collect the product how do you purify this and make all of this economically viable um, mm -hmm. compared maybe to a very compact electrolyzer I think this is a, a, a major challenge that I would not know at the moment how to do it, but I find it really intriguing and I like to think about it and work on it. Um, this is, I think, is an addition to all the, the conventional arguments. Of course, it's, it's, we have not shown square kilometers, the efficiencies are not where there should be, the stability, etc. But just as a, an intrinsic thought, how do, you, how do you do chemistry on a square kilometer scale for me is not obvious. And, and it's again, exciting to think about it. On the products, I'm not sure. I don't think we have a product yet um, where we would say that's an, that's it's a design product. So that what what I've shown to you are products. If you go to Sigma Aldrich, they're more expensive than the starting material. But I, but what we cannot do so far is really design specific molecules, and that's something what we would like to do. You know, we've we've started now a collaboration with AstraZeneca, for example, a pharma company. Mm -hmm. And actually, we want to know from them what, what, what are tricky reactions to run, what are really desired products, and then we will try to tailor the catalysis towards a single product. Uh, so it, it's too early for me, I think, to really say this is the, the one product to go for. But all I can say at this stage, we are, I think we have the right people to talk to, and we are starting this actually very much now at this stage. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. So I, uh, I, I, I am very appreciative for your kind of reply. And, uh, uh, yes, I think for the product and uh, I think in the industrial area, we are also uh, trying to finding that what kind, of, what kind of product is the most desirable and uh, has the most uh, demand in the coming market. And also for the huge, for the, how to say, for the large uh, mass production, also there's a, we need to, uh, need, there's a very, uh, there's a possible, uh, necessary to comp uh, to cooperation with different kind of uh, uh, not only the professors in the researchers in the reaction itself but also incoming uh, including the chemical engineering and also kind and also other kind of uh, areas so thank you very much professors maybe we can have some uh, further talking thank you very much yeah I'd like to thank you very much thank you and Okay, one more question. I think some audience, uh, Bono, please do the, the, the short question, please. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so it's once again, Werner from Estonia speaking. Uh, inspired a little bit by previous question and also by Professor Reisner, called for the PhD students. I wanted to ask you, Professor. Uh, so what will be the directions for your lab for next, let's say, five years? So will it be search for new catalysts for uh, reactions or optimizations of current systems or okay. something completely new? So, so I, I do have to show one slide then. <laughs> one that I skip. <laughs> so, I mean, the, for me in the, in the group, generally we follow three lines of research. One is uh, CO2 reduction. And the future for us will be more complex chemical reactions. So actually not stop at CO or formate, but actually go in, you know, in cascades types to, to, to more complex CC bond formation, et cetera. Um, the other one is biohybrids. So we have a longstanding passion of interfacing 
enzymes, live cells with semiconductors from a fundamental point of view, but I think also the chemistry space is very exciting. And then the, the last one, maybe more on a, on a device view, is actually summarized here. This is a, a, a perspective that was actually written by Qian Wang here and Chen and Ron Ray for, uh, not so long ago. And I think what would be a, a really a dream, uh, not just of me, but I think hopefully for most of the community, if we could finally establish uh, really tangible prototype systems where we can actually show that that integrated systems are superior to photovoltaic plus electrolysis. Um, I think this is the elephant in the room and people are completely right to ask, why do you do all of this? You can just take a PV and an electrolyzer. And you know, the, the floating leaf I've shown before, I find it exciting in a way because this is uh, one thing you cannot do with a PV electrolyzer. And, and I think as a community, we should look for these things. If they're useful now or not, actually for me, it's even secondary, but we just need to work and work out the advantages. And another potential advantage to, to get straight to your question is, you know, for a photovoltaic, um, heat is actually a bad thing. So if, if you operate in a desert or if it heats up to 60 to 70 degrees, you lose about 15 to 20 percent of your efficiency. So usually you want to keep, keep them cold. But actually, for chemistry, heat is a very good thing because heat accelerates your, your catalysis. So I think with an integrated design, we can really benefit from this heat. Um, but generally, I think we need to think much more broadly about the infrared spectrum. So I think we have gotten quite good of using UV and blue light, you know, for water splitting, etc. I've shown. Uh, I've cut it a bit short, but I'm really excited that the waste to chemical conversion can really be powered by visible spectrum. But the IR spectrum is the big question mark. So I think starting to, to, to think of integrating different technologies to use infrared in an integrated setup is, is a way to go. And here on the bottom, just showing a couple of examples, how this could be potentially done or what people are already doing to some extent. And, you know, and if you get all this right, if you can do really more exciting chemistry, um, if you can if you can show an efficiency boost, if you can show applicability in an environment where PV electrolysis is not available, then I think we really have something. And then this could really become a cutting edge technology that goes out of the academic labs and really penetrates the, the, the companies very, very quickly. And I would find this very exciting. Just maybe be part of showing a few of such concepts that can be taken further. That's my answer to this question. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think Thank I will you. have just the last comment for a professor. I think it's a lot of reactions you mentioned today, especially the last ones about the formation on formic acid and so on. They really uh, remind me of prehistoric Earth form formulation, like life formulation reactions, which scientists think about when they try to figure out how the life on Earth was created. So I was thinking that maybe you can also like take a look on those like pre pre life uh, reactivity of Earth to have some inspiration for reactions your system can try to conduct. Uh, yes, actually, I had yeah. This is a, too long of a story. I think we would need to talk in a pub about that. But uh, I had quite some interest in in, in premortal conditions, prebiotic chemistry, and photocatalysis, because of course pyrite, iron sulfide, has been around for a long time, and uh, there's I think there's possibility that things actually played a role. Um, in, in, in origin of life. But I think it's a very different topic. And for me, ultimately, I decided to drop this because we also need to focus. And it's, you know, if, if you try to do everything, you do nothing. Um, I completely agree with you. It's very fascinating. But from an academic or PI point of view, I think I already feel sometimes we are too broad, but if it's more about bringing things together rather than trying new things. I think for, you know, for young scientists, um, uh, these are all very exciting directions to go and to explore. And, you know, we, we, we all need to do different things anyway and different aspects. But for me personally, I've thought about this. I even had some grant applications in, but I decided actually not to, to stop it and focus on, on technology and and, and, and and work towards the net zero future. I see. But then definitely for pub talk. Anyway, yes. thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I think the... One more question. I wanted to get the, this final question. Okay, please do the Tomi, Tomita song. Okay. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question about the system using gold as a conductor. So in my knowledge, uh, gold nanoparticle can catalyze hydrogen evolution. Mm -hmm. So is hydrogen evolution by gold nanoparticles competing with uh, hydrogen generation by ruthenium nanoparticles? 
No, it's 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 clean. We have we have we have done all. I mean, the the really golden hydrogen comes from Professor Doman's lab, and there I'm sure they have done the controls. But also for in our lab, when we looked at CO2 reduction, we did all the controls. So in fact, our concern was not hydrogen generation, but CO2 um, reduction on gold. Um, but also here, if we do not have our cobalt catalyst or proton reduction catalyst, we do not see any products being formed. I think it's because for gold, you need to have you need quite some driving force and we do not reach the potentials to go into CO2 reduction with the gold. Oh. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, may I question? Uh, I just wondered uh, how to control the electron number. I mean, you, in your case, just single electron transfer what double, I mean, hydride transfer, because if a single electron transfer, it should be produced a short radical or hydrogen radical, something like. How to control? I mean, this, uh, I'm just concerned about your, your system. You, you mean on a specific system or in general? What is for, for you mean for the hydride? For, you, or your, for example, you want water oxidation and the produce the, the electron, yeah. how, to, how to control the electron numbers. I mean, so this, well, well so essentially, if, if I take an example with the photocatalyst sheet with this bisteprit in cobalt catalyst, mm -hmm. what we think is happening is you go from the, the cobalt, uh, cobalt 2 to cobalt 1. Mm -hmm. Then one of the pyridines I mentioned flips up and then you, you react with a proton to form a cobalt three hydride. So actually it's two electrons, mm -hmm. but, you, but you start with cobalt two, cobalt one, then cobalt one reacts with a proton to give a cobalt three hydride. And then from there you react. So it always has to be two electrons. Okay. So it's, whenever we react with this, with a proton or with CO2, it, there's a two electron transfer. Mm -hmm. We do not think that we form a CO2 radical at any stage because this would be such a, uh, 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 activation barrier that we do not have the potential for this chemistry. Mm. And also from the product rate, everything hints to two electron transfers. Very good. Oh, I think there's just constant. Many cases, the, for example, the uh, prussium catalyst, they are you know, single electron transfer, so they produce a radical. So mm. this uh, maybe enhance the, the directions, uh, no, decrease the direction, some, something. Anyway, and also the, I want to, I don't know well about the, but the, I'm just simple question to, for example, synthetic catalyst or the one journal or textbook, something they, for example, show to, to make the synthesis of formic acid. This pH seven, they usually mark the negative 0 0.6 volt, something like. And the biological system, they usually zero point uh, minus zero point four millivolt, a uh, volt, something. Like that. And but actually, if we using the biological enzyme is about zero point uh, minus zero point three, something like. That. Where is what is? I mean, I don't know what 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 is the reason of that? Do you know? I, I did not quite understand. So you, you say there are different potentials if you use yeah. a biocatalyst and synthetic catalyst. Yes, yes. The, the thermodynamic potential. Thermodynamic potential. No, yeah. I, I think that, so the, if I understood the question correctly, I think there are mistakes in the literature. There yeah. is, I mean, the thermodynamic potential is, is independent of the catalyst because, because we are talking about CO2 reduction to formate. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is, in fact, if you look at the tables, they're usually correct at pH zero. So when you really talk about standard conditions. But the problem is very often people use the tabulated um, redox potential, reduction potential at pH zero and mm -hmm. extrapolate to pH seven without taking um, the pKa of formate into account. Mm -hmm. So if, if you do, if, if you just assume it's always a two electron, um, two proton reaction, you end up at this minus zero point. Let me think, did I get this right? Minus zero point six volts. Six, yeah, yeah. But if but if you do take into account the pKa and that actually it is only a two electron one proton reaction mm -hmm. pH seven, you you are very close to hydrogen. You actually at minus uh, zero point four volts. Mm -hmm. So at pH seven, the minus zero point four volts is the correct potential because mm -hmm. it, it takes into account the the pKa of the formate. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think there's. Point problem is from the, the hydrogen transport or electron transport. 
transport, I guess. It's not different. The, the reason, of that, reason of that, the, for example, since the catalyst, platinum catalyst, because there's a single electron transfer, so, so I think there is maybe difference the 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 mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you. Just just mm -hmm. give me one second. I'll show you. I think depend on the the, the single electron or the double electron transport is different to the catalyst. I think. But no, but the, but the thermodynamic potential oh. is independent of the of the catalyst. It, it only depends on the on the Gibbs free energy of the reaction. Mm. Uh, but let me show here. So this is from a. Yeah, this one. Yeah, I see. So this is, it's, this is the Pobe diagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of CO two reduction to formate. So if you are the at pH zero, so this is standard conditions. If you can see my cursor. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see this is at, at roughly this minus 0 0.1 that you will find tabulated. I know, yeah. And, and, and what most people do, um, if, if they want to extrapolate to neutral pH, etc., they just draw a, line, a, a line. But but the line does not reflect the pKa value of, of all the equilibria you have involved. Because if you go from, from pHd to 0 to 7, for example, you do not form the same product. You only form formic acid under very uh, acidic conditions. And when you go to neutral pH, you're actually forming formate. So this means it's, it's a two electron, one, uh, two electron, one proton couple. And this shifts, it's not a linear line. You, you know, and also the pKa is all of, the, it's quite complicated yeah. actually. But the, okay. the, the correct potential is, is you're very close to proton reduction at pH 7. Okay, I see. And this, is, and, this, and this must be independent of the catalyst because it's just the, 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 the potential um, wait, how's it? The Gibbs free energy equals minus the number of moles times Faraday constant times the potential. That that's what it is. So it's a, it's a Gibbs free energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Okay, I see. Uh, uh, there is no any more other questions. So I think we the the, the, the time is line up, line up. I think. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And I wanted to close the this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks for, for the, the speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.